Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on webinar today. My name is Ricky Lee Kierkegaard. I work as program specialist with the Health Program Group at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And I'm very pleased to be hosting this webinar today, which has been underway for um, quite a while on cash plus approaches to achieving multiple outcomes across HIV, health, and well being in Sub Saharan Africa. The webinar is uh, convened as a joint webinar between UNICEF's HIV and social policy teams. And we are intending it to be the first webinar in a series on social protection and health. Um, apologies that my slides were a bit slow. So on the screen, you can see the program for today's webinar. We'll start out with an overview of cash plus approaches within national social protection systems and considerations for integration of other sectors. Then we'll move on by a review of the evidence on the effectiveness of cash and cash plus approaches for adolescents in Africa. We will then move on to a presentation of, of findings from an impact evaluation of a government implemented program targeting adolescents in Tanzania. And this will then be followed by a presentation on lessons learned from implementation at country level in Tanzania. We will end the webinar with ample time for discussion and Q&A. And while we have the webinar planned for around an hour and 15 minutes, we can continue the, the Q&A and the discussion for another 15 minutes if, uh, if need be. So before we get started, I'd like to go through just a few housekeeping rules First of all, if you have any technical issues at all, please send us a message via the chat box and we'll try our best to support. Um, if you have any general comments, please also send them through on the chat box, selecting all panelists and attendees. And if you have a question for any of the speakers, please send them at any time of the webinar using the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window in the middle. We will take all of the questions at the end. Um, but please send them through at any time. Finally, the webinar is being recorded and the recording and the PowerPoint will be made available online after the webinar on childrenandaids.org, where you can also subscribe to the Children and AIDS Learning Collaborative and be um, notified of future webinars and find much more or many more resources. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ruth Graham Golder, who is UNICEF's social protection and gender expert at UNICEF headquarters in New York. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm not sure where you're dialing in um, in the world, but it's really great to be here. Um, my job really uh, today is to provide a little bit of a, a brief sort of scene setter before, before the meat of the presentation from other colleagues, but allow me to say how excited I am um, to be here together. I think um, the, the emerging evidence and practice around Cash Plus is you know, incredibly um, exciting um, and we're seeing sort of really promising potential across a range of different sectors that at UNICEF we really care about and I think the work that the Accelerator Hub um, and, and Lucy and Rachel and colleagues are doing is, is so interesting um, and, and the work in Tanzania is, is fascinating and, and I talk about it all the time because I think the, the findings that are coming from it and the operational learnings are just such a rich seam so great to be together. Um, I thought what I might do is just answer sort of four very simple questions, um, just to sort of set the scene. Uh, the first sort of why cash at all and why cash plus? Um, the second, you know, what, what really is cash plus? Because it's quite jargony, really. Um, and I don't know what different perspectives people are coming from, but just to sort of break that down um, briefly. Um, third, slightly provocatively, why the hype? And fourth, what are we learning from UNICEF's practice? Next slide, please. Why cash and why cash plus? Um, so this is a lot of text, um, but I can't resist partly just to show the wealth of evidence that is out there, but to give a bit of a, a, a flavour for people that are coming um, at this from different angles, you know, we know that there is a, a significant and growing body of evidence around the uh, multi-sectoral impacts that cash alone can have. And in fact, many cash transfer programmes have some type of what we'd call sort of plus um, intervention um, linked to them to some level. 
um, and just to sort of highlight some of the evidence that we're seeing in these sort of areas of, of gender equality, poverty, health, well-being, areas that are all very close to my heart. You know, we're seeing impact heart and we're seeing impacts around increasing women's decision making um, power, both in terms of sort of contraceptive use, expenditure. Uh, we're seeing reductions in monetary poverty. We're seeing sort of improving access to basic services such as education, health services, and then a set of, I think, really interesting um, findings around reducing risky sexual behaviours, some sort of different um, findings depending on context and gender, um, but nevertheless, you know, highly um, relevant to, to the issue of HIV and, and health and well-being, reductions in intimate partner violence, and in some cases, improvements in psychosocial and well-being outcomes. I'm not going to kind of unpack all of that, but just want to give a bit of a sense of, you know, we're seeing that cash alone and cash, particularly when it's adequate, timely, um, um, and provides sort of a, a more holistic package of support, um, can have really significant um, impacts. One of the things that I wanted to highlight, though, is I think it's very easy in the international development sector or in government or at large to get caught in a sort of um, blinkered view of I'm focusing on my sector. So I'm going to really focus on because I'm working on child protection, uh, the outcomes around abuse, violence and exploitation, or I'm an economist and I'm really focusing on monetary poverty. Um, and, and that's really where I'm going to um sort of set out my stall and I think what what is great about the cash plus approach is that it really forces us to take that step back and to think about what are the sort of intersecting uh, risk pathways vulnerabilities and what sort of holistic package of support that um, children women families really need um, and the other thing that I want to highlight I think around the cash plus approach is that we really need to keep in mind the sort of deep and resilient structures and root causes of poverty gender inequality and, and, and sort of the antithesis to health and well-being um, people talk sometimes about cash being king and as well as being somewhat patriarchal way of describing it. Yes, there's great evidence around this, um, but clearly it's not the answer to everything. So I think you know, that's, that's why, why cash, but also why cash plus. Next slide, please. So what's cash plus exactly? Just uh, for anyone that's wondering about this quite jargony um, phrase, as I've said, cash transfers in themselves are really well evidenced investments that contribute to many important outcomes. Cash plus is simply a shorthand for linking or combining those cash transfers. So that can be a really wide range of interventions from quite basic information, for example, complementary information on maternal health that's linked to a social assistance program, a whole range of services, anything from sort of links to psychosocial support um, to sort of provision of childcare services. Um, training and then these things can, can kind of overlap but uh, support around social networks and social norms activities so I think about things like uh, components or modules or training around parenting and depending on their design they might have a really kind of intentional um, social norms um, dimension. Um, as I said, can cover a diverse range of interventions. I have seen programs that simply have text messages about um, where to get the cash being described as cash plus. I don't think that would strictly fall into the definition for myself. Um, two kind of highly complex sort of multi-component packages of support, um, whether sort of embedded in the cash transfer program itself or just linkages to services that exist elsewhere. Um, and of course, can be of varying quality and can range from very, very small scale, you know, tens of uh, people through to sort of millions at uh, a uh, national scale. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to take a, a brief step back just to say, I think in terms of um, where we see cash plus, we see it as absolutely core to social protection systems. So, you know, really want to get away from the idea that these are small scale ad hoc programs. They are a fundamental and important part of the package of support that, that, that any national government should be looking to, to provide and um, to address social and economic vulnerabilities um, and risks and respond to needs across the life cycle. Um, so I, I really like this um, this image because I think it's just quite a nice way of illustrating. Um, often, I think in social protection, we really uh, end up having a conversation about just one aspect of the life course or one aspect of social protection. Like we're just talking about cash or we're just talking about health insurance. Uh, but actually, when we think about the people that, that we serve and that we're trying to, to reach and support, or just our own lives, um, we have different needs at different points in our lives. Um, and, 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 and we need support in responding to those, whether it's around pregnancy or the first thousand days of your own or your child's life, whether it's about sort of early childhood, adolescence, um, whether a specific risk, vulnerabilities and opportunities, um, all the way through to old age. And that, you know, from UNICEF's perspective, it's really critical that social protection systems are developed um, 
based on the evidence, and we're seeing this promising evidence around cash plus, which is why we're excited about it and talking about it today. Um, of course, that it's child sensitive and that we're really considering the needs of children um, and, and sort of the kind of support they need within families or from caregivers and from, from um, the wider community, um, that they're gender responsive um, or ideally transformative. And we're really thinking about a set of um, inequalities um, and, and marginalization that exists in society and that they're nationally led and that we're building towards this vision of universal coverage, much as we are with health um, systems as well. Next slide, please. So question three, I put this a bit provocatively because I don't think it's necessarily hype, but why the hype? Um, I think we, 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 we hear quite a lot about Cash Plus, um, but I think that's because there's really growing evidence. We're going to hear a lot more about this from um, Lucy and others um, shortly, but as an accelerator for change across a number of different areas. Um, and you know, this is drawing from UNICEF's um, extensive experience. We're working in social protection um, in over 110 countries around the world. Uh, Cash Plus programs, um, we're working on them in around half of those contexts. Um, and that's a very diverse range of experience from you know, linking cash transfers the child protection components in Turkey. There's a conditional cash transfer uh, program um, for refugees focused on education um, to link linkages between cash and a range of different kinds of support, ECD, financial inclusion, particularly for women, um, maternal and child health in Burundi, and then the adolescent um, sensitive uh, cash plus work in Tanzania that we're going to dive into and, and unpack um, a bit further. And then just, I think, really to highlight that we are seeing particularly promising um, uh, results um, in key and overlapping areas. So in terms of child poverty, adolescent well-being and gender equality. And I think that's why there is this particular interest, because in a world of um, increasing sort of fiscal constraints, we're really looking for what are the sets of interventions that will support outcomes in a number of different areas. Um, and I, I also want to just highlight in terms of the hype, programs haven't commonly been designed to enable researchers to rigorously compare the impacts of different types of plus activities um, linked to cash. So for a range of different outcomes, you know, sometimes I see papers that sort of say, well, they're not having an impact on X outcome and therefore it's not worth the investment. Um, actually, I think you know, we need to be looking at the range of different outcomes and it's quite hard to sort of cost that and show the sort of uh, sort of relative costs of one package over another when they're sort of complex and, and multi-sectoral, but we really need to be thinking about, uh, about the, the world in this way and, and, and further research is needed. Next slide, please. The last question I thought would be useful just to share a little bit from sort of those um, 110 countries and particularly sort of 51 where we're working on cash plus um, programming we're in a process of continuous learning, but I think in terms of sort of operational uh, and programmatic, there are a few things that we really wanted to highlight, um, both things that have worked and also uh, where, where things haven't. Um, the first is I think the importance of having really clear objectives and being clear about what are the sets of issues, risks, vulnerabilities that we're seeking to address. And you know, I think the Tanzania example is a really interesting case of this, looking at gender inequalities, looking at multi-sectoral needs, and looking at the multifaceted experiences of, of poverty, of, of gender inequality and, and, and well-being. Um, the second is you know, the importance of the quality of implementation, and that's the whole range of things from the time that staff have, the sheer numbers of people, um, the relevant skills, um, where people are actually based. Uh, is, is everybody in the capital or um, are, are people sort of located in where, where they can reach um, the people that the program is trying to support and the assets those people have? You know, I've heard um, in so many cases issues in terms of having the resources to get to the people that, um, that, that we need to. Um, buy-in and feasibility for scale-up. I think this is so important, but ensuring that you have buy-in from a wide range of stakeholders. Coordination is so key when you're trying to work in this multi-sectoral way, um, and it's not easy, and most people have limited time in their uh, day jobs to, to manage this, unless there is significant buy-in to do so, to reach across the different sectors as we're doing today, um, and, and to really come together to, to learn and to work together. Um, Monitoring for unintended consequences. So I think you know, we can't assume that just because something has worked in one case that it will work somewhere else. Um, and, and, and also being ready to adapt as we learn from those lessons. Investing in rigorous evidence from the get go. And I think also I would highlight sticking with that as you go. You know, if you don't find the impacts that um, you want, of course, looking at why that is and adapting, but not um, 
sort of throwing out, out at the first moment, uh, learn what you can and, and adapt and, and, and continue. Um, leadership coordination and drive. You know, I think we have to have champions for this agenda um, to ensure that particularly we're moving from sort of small scale pilots to um, that scale up that can really um, reach kind of adequate numbers of people. And then finally, walking before you run, um, and, and, and then don't forget that your aim is to be running. So there's a two parts to this. I think in terms of walk before you can run, I think um, it's very easy to sit down and brainstorm a very you know, highly complex theory of change um, and, and sort of a million different components. But the reality is that setting up a basic cash transfer program with a few plus components um, is a huge operational uh, challenge, particularly if you are working in a context with a nascent or, or non-existent social protection system. Um, and clearly sort of the parallel challenges in terms of health services, you know, if adequate and high quality services are not there, um, then, you know, we, we're not gonna be able to have the impact that we want. And so making sure that we have those basic set up already. Um, and then the don't forget that your aim is to be running. I think it's easy to get stuck in the mindset of like get the nuts and bolts right and, and forget the ambition. Um, so I think you know, having that long-term vision in mind in terms of um, when you know that you know, a model is working, the scale up, the follow through, ensuring that you have a model that you know is going to be um, feasible to scale up beyond um, beyond those sort of initial pilots that are, that are so popular. So that's sort of a bit of a, a scene setter from the UNICEF perspective. Um, I think uh, back over to Rike to um, continue the webinar. Over. Thank you so much, Ruth. This was really excellent, an excellent overview. And I think you set the stage very, very well for the remaining part of the webinar um, and for our remaining speakers. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Lucy Kluver and Rachel Yates for the next presentation. Um, Lucy Kluver is a professor of child and family social work at Oxford University and a lecturer in psychiatry and mental health at the University of Cape Town. And Rachel Yates is strategic advocacy lead at the Accelerate Hub, and she's an associate fellow at the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at Oxford University. So over to you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Ruth and Ricky, you've really, you've really set this up. And really what, what Rachel and I are going to be talking about is to give some of the new evidence which is supporting and building um, how we're thinking about cash plus care on HIV, but really on a set of wider interventions. And, and really, I suppose, just, just to start by saying that what we're gonna be talking about is certainly not our work independently. It's, it's a whole set of researchers across Africa, um, the UK and Europe and the US, but also um, that much of this has been um, a set of um, discussions and engagement with colleagues at UNICEF, with colleagues at USA, for example, at um, the World Food Programme and, and other agencies. We don't want to take credit or blame. If you don't agree with anything, we'll, we'll blame it on you and colleagues. So really just to start off by saying that we've, we've realized and the SDGs have forced us to realize that if we're going to have success for Africa's next generation, that we can't just be focusing on one single thing. We can't just focus on sexual and reproductive health. It's hugely important, but we could get that right and a young girl drops out of school and, and we, we've still not succeeded in, in what we need to do. So what we're trying to do is move from thinking about dealing with one issue at a time, as we said, to thinking particularly in context of reduced fiscal capacity, reduced aid, how can we reach as many, as many benefits as we possibly can with simple interventions or simple plus interventions? The Accelerate Hub is really just a group of, um, of academics and young people um, and organizations set up to try and unpack and find the evidence base for how we can best do this. And so we are all, I think, really aware of the substantial increased risk that COVID has brought to young people um, in the region, but, but also globally. We've seen 7 million unanticipated unplanned pregnancies. We've seen a huge rise in, um, in child marriage, we've got new data showing that 5.2 million children have, have lost in a primary caregiver to COVID-associated orphanhood. We've got, um, although many schools are starting to go back or have gone back, we've still got around, UNESCO estimates, a billion children cycling in and out of school. 
and we've got huge increases in poverty. And when we start to look at our responses, and this is an example of um, work that CDC and the World Bank are doing in thinking about a response to COVID-associated orphanhood, we immediately see that we can't just focus on one thing alone. We can't, it's essential to work on vaccine and prevention. It's essential to work on what we do and how we place children in safe environments. And then it's essential to, um, to ensure that families can look after them as they grow up. And, we, and what we end up with looking at is a combination between a health response and then really a cash plus care based response. And so we start to think about what are these cash plus care combinations? As, as Ruth identified, it's not cash, just cash plus anything. It's thinking about what is the strongest evidence base for selecting the simplest possible combinations that are going to have as, the impacts across as many key sustainable development goals and as many key COVID impacts as possible. And so when we start to think about our interventions, we have to start thinking a bit differently. This is an example of a um, typical way that a researcher or an academic would look at an intervention. We might be interested in whether um, in increasing girls' attendance in school reduces HIV. So we do a program to improve school attendance. We measure whether it's improving school attendance. And then we, we test whether that's impacted HIV. We might also test um, whether it's impacting something associated like adolescent pregnancy. But actually, if we think about what doing keeping an adolescent girl in school does, we see a multiplicity of impacts. We're going to see impacts on her education, on her employment, on her future risk of intimate partner violence. And we're going to see impacts on things like the school readiness, the nutritional status of her children. And so with some interventions, by just looking at single outcomes at the same time, again, Ruth mentioned this, we may be underestimating their value. The Hub is doing research, um, and it's a combination of cohorts, randomized trials, and, and analysis of, of amazing data sets like the MIX and the VAX um, across a range of countries in the region. And this is allowing us to start to see whether there are patterns across different countries. And let's start to think about what we're looking at. This is work that um, Professor Mark Orkin um, and colleagues and I started a, a couple of years ago. And essentially what we did in this study was we took a cohort of a thousand adolescents living with HIV in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And we tested 14 different possible interventions and many more different combinations of interventions to ask what, what is producing the biggest, um, the biggest effects across as many SDGs as possible. Now, I should say school feeding came in a close fourth, but the top three in this came out to be safe schools, cash transfers and parenting support. And if we look at cash transfers at the top, just as an example, we see that an adolescent who um, has a cash transfer has lower rates of abuse, higher rates of retention in HIV care, around 13%, and improved rates of school progression. But then we ask ourselves, what happens if we combine these three support services, parenting support, cash transfers, and safe schools? And what we see is that even with this relatively simple combination, these are all services already provided by government or communities, we see a wider range of positive impacts and greater depth of those impacts. So no abuse has gone from around 13% with just cash to 51% rate, and this is incidence rates, um, with a combination of cash, parenting support, and safe schools. And so this was really our first indication that we were starting to see um, positive, what UNDP would call development accelerators, um, supporting multiple positive um, impacts across multiple SDGs. And this was a cash plus combination. We didn't start off assuming that it would be. There were many other potential options. Let's start to look at some other work in other countries. If we look to the left, this is work by the World Bank in Uganda. And we see, again, a combination of, a, of a, um, economic empowerment with a safety-focused intervention and mentorship, improving employment, reducing child marriage and pregnancy and forced sex. If you look to the right, this is another randomized trial. Um, and we see in Zimbabwe that a combination of cash 
plus health education, that was primarily SRH education, was reducing violence, it was reducing condom, um, transactional sex, improving condom use, and improving economic outcomes. We start to see, as we look across the region, more and more of these. We see, for example, Professor Lorraine Scherzworth, are we after combination of cash and safe community, reducing um, educational risks and mental health risks. We see in Sierra Leone at the bottom another World Bank program, cash and um, SRH education with a range of positive outcomes. Recent exciting work by the Population Council in Kenya showing um, that a, a combination of cash and um, violence prevention dialogues with a range of positive outcomes, particularly it seems for adolescent girls, we're seeing these um, even more strongly. And in Zambia, exciting new work on adolescents with disabilities. And again, we're seeing a cash transfer combined with educational support with positive impacts. As we started to do these, we more and more started to see a pattern that cash um, or some kind of economic empowerment was coming up repeatedly as, as the key, um, as a kind of repeated uh, input combined with, with other things. And we'll talk a bit later about those patterns. This is some work which I think is, is really interesting as we start, and, and colleagues at UNICEF are always reminding us that we have to look at government level programs and provision. And this is exciting work led by Will Rugard and Salinga Dozumunu, looking at the Ethiopia Health Extension Program. This is a government program where community health workers went into the community and delivered primarily SRH advice, but also more general health and sanitation. And what we see from this for adolescent girls is substantive improvements beyond the areas we would expect in education, in child marriage, in early pregnancy. This is very new work, not yet peer reviewed, but um, in, um, in Zimbabwe using the mix, which is fantastic. This was a, one of the only mix that measured social protection in it. And again, um, the same, the same team have found that the access to social protection in Zimbabwe is associated for adolescent girls with reductions in child marriage and improvements in school progression. And this is uh, exciting work that UNICEF Zimbabwe is involved in. I'm not going to talk about this in detail because this is coming up um, with Tia and Ulrika talking about the fantastic funding um, from UNICEF and this Combat Cash Plus program and, and if we think of it in the same model we start to see these multiple impacts across sustainable development goals. So what are some of the patterns that we're starting to see? Well um, we again we went into this with a neutral approach but what has come out over and over again is that we're seeing cash plus combinations and it seems that there's not just one effective cash plus combination. We're seeing um, repeated impacts of cash you mentioned of cash plus safe programs, effective ones. We're seeing cash plus SRH education as a key combination. And we're seeing emerging evidence of cash plus psychosocial support, of some innovative social and behavior change um, interventions, and some new evidence which we'll be showing soon on, on cash plus childcare as effective for multiple impacts for both adolescent mothers and their children. But we also do, as you said, have to think about cash plus um, and adjusting it across the life course. And, and if we just think of a couple of different examples here, we see um, evidences in recent systematic review and meta-analysis done by Madison Little um, on for, for, for young children seeing combinations of cash plus parenting as effective, um, cash plus early childhood programs. If we start to look more towards adolescence and, and early adulthood, we see cash plus skills building, cash plus SRH um, um, education. And as we as as women, young women move forward into motherhood, we see a cycle where we're back to ideas of cash plus parenting as improving both maternal and child outcomes. I'm going to hand over to Rachel. While Rachel gets on, I'll just I'll just mention our um, partnerships, and I think this is um, this is both testament to um, to the combined thinking that has gone into this, and I think this is really unusual actually, because often you'll see things that are driven by UN agencies or driven by a single government or driven by academics, 
And what we've seen with these cash plus approaches is, is a combination whereby there has been um, combinations of trying out programs, of testing programs, of thinking about how we want to put these together. And it's resulted in, a, in, a, um, in an unusual set of collaborations that have meant that we've been able to bring this evidence base forward very quickly from, from 10 years ago when it was really just a concept to, to now when it's really, um, really a strong evidence base. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel. Lucy. I'm on now. Right. Um, so one of the examples that we wanted to really highlight, particularly thinking about the links um, on sort of cash plus and social protection for health and HIV impacts, was really thinking about how we apply this work in a high um, HIV epidemic situation. Um, we've been doing uh, a lot of work recently as the Accelerate Hub, led by Alona Tosca at Cape Town University, looking at opportunities for economic strengthening to prevent HIV in adolescent girls and young women. Um, and you'll note that in Lesotho, the particularly high rates of HIV incidence in adolescent girls, it's almost, I think it's between five and six times greater in adolescent girls and young women than it is um, with boys. So a really sort of vulnerable group. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the sort of critical things that we need to unpack, and I think it comes back to Ruth's point at the beginning about really understanding how cash and cash plus can disrupt different risk pathways and to be very intentional about combinations of uh, cash and cash plus for, for these different risks um, and building it in into sort of different timelines. So, for example, in um, Lesotho, we see that there are a number of um, sort of shocks that are faced in terms of poverty, adverse weather events, um, and these are compounded by gender discrimination and harmful norms. Um, these factors have in turn uh, led to greater food insecurity, school dropout, intimate partner violence, which in turn impacts on um, sort of high risk uh, sexual behaviors, which can lead to different HIV outcomes. So one of the things that we've been really trying to understand in a situation like this, to working with uh, Ministry of Social Development and Ministry of Health, is how can cash and cash plus contribute to, for example, keep girls in school, reduce gender-based violence, and um, how these interventions have worked together. So moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we have uh, really focused down on is really looking at um, the schooling pathway, which seems to be so critical for many different outcomes um, for adolescent girls and really thinking through how um, uh, social protection in the form of, say, uh, school bursaries or child grants can keep girls in school. And we know that this will be good, not just for HIV outcomes, but for a whole range of outcomes, including things like child marriage. And I definitely recommend you looking at Andrew Malhotra's study on uh, child marriage and the links to education. So in Lesotho, just looking at the next slide, um, I think one of the opportunities, um, or there are many opportunities really to build on and to leverage existing social protection programs. And I think this is also something that will be picked, on, picked up on with the Ujana Salama presentation about how do we, first of all, map out what are the social protection programs that are out there? And then how do we layer on um, different, more gender transformative outcomes on top of these? So rather than setting up sort of standalone and possibly unsustainable programs, but really sort of link to those existing interventions and think about how do we add things like productive grants onto existing cash transfers, social behavior change communication, or um, interventions, for example, to um, sort of protect against sort of mental health uh, distress. So these are all the opportunities that we, we can look at and discuss further today. Next slide. Um, so, so these are the sort of some of the, the sort of key opportunities that we've seen uh, to date. So just to sort of summarize, um, we do see very strong evidence that cash plus interventions are effective, and these are effective on a range of multiple of a range of health and broader SDG outcomes. 
Um, but in order to uh, develop relevant and contextual responses, it's really important to understand the drivers. And that includes looking at the, the drivers to which uh, how much is economically driven, how much is driven by harmful social norms. And these are factors that will differ from uh, across contexts. Um, we think there's a lot of opportunity to look at the combination of cash and social behavior change. Um, and I think this is something that Innocenti uh, have also been looking at and considering in their work as well. Um, in addition, and this is something that came out of a meeting this morning on HIV sensitive social protection being organized by UNAIDS, um, cash is not a substitution for other forms of social protection which can help reduce catastrophic um, health expenses. So it's important to also look at the enabling environment and policies around free education and health, which can complement and reinforce the impacts of uh, cash transfers. And finally, um, as we've highlighted, um, one of the, the challenges in building the evidence is often having data sets that don't talk to each other. So we really would like to sort of push for increased social protection um, measures within the household data sets, but also bringing in social protection uh, measures um, into a range of uh, other programs, whether they're education, health, and, and so on. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, look forward to um, questions as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, both to Lucy and Rachel and the team behind this presentation and this work for taking us through a rapid overview of what the evidence says when it comes to adolescence and cash plus, and also what that means in a COVID world. Um, I think it was really interesting how you highlighted how Catch Plus is really bringing collaboration and bringing sectors together. So with that, we'll now move on to the second part of the webinar, which will focus on findings and learnings from a government implemented Catch Plus pilot and evaluation in Tanzania. So the evidence uh, mm -hmm. will be presented by Tia Palermo and Lusatio Cagiula. Tia Palermo is Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Environmental Health at the University at Buffalo State University of New York. And she previously worked as Social Policy Specialist with UNICEF's Office of Research in Occenti. Lusatio Cagiula is an independent consultant based in Tanzania, and she worked as Social Policy Special Analyst with UNICEF's Office of Research in Occenti from 2017 to earlier this year. Um, so Tia and Lusatio, over to you. Thank you, Rika, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so as Rika uh, introduced us, uh, my colleague Tia Palermo and I will present uh, this um, example from Tanzania of a study called Ujana Salama or Swahili for safe youth, uh, which is a case plus model for safe transitions to a healthy and productive uh, adulthood. Next please, Tia. Social protection can address many structural drivers of HIV and can also mitigate some of the risks faced by adolescents. Existing research has shown that cash alone has had many positive benefits, including school enrollment, empowerment, but sometimes it is not enough to overcome all of the barriers that adolescents face to safe and productive adulthoods. Um, in Tanzania and regionally, evidence was pointing to economic strengthening as among the most effective at improving broad adolescent outcomes, including violence reduction. At the time of the initiation of the Cash Plus intervention, there was a window of opportunity to partner with the government social protection program, which provided cash and livelihood enhancement to over 1 million households nationwide. The decision was made to pilot this intervention within government structures in an effort to understand the effectiveness that might be expected were the program to be scaled up. The intervention was layered on top of the existing government cash transfer program and Uli and Frank will go into more detail later, but it comprised of face-to-face -face training in livelihoods and sexual and reproductive health, including HIV information. 
layered onto this cash transfer program and targeted to adolescents living in cash transfer households, which were among the poorest 10% in the country. In addition to the face-to-face -face trainings, youth received mentoring and coaching, a productive grant, and information and referral to strengthened adolescent-friendly health services in government facilities in the districts where the Cash Plus program was being implemented. We have had a very locally involved approach to both the study design as well as the dissemination. We had national participation in the evaluation team. So there were researchers uh, from UNICEF Office of Research in Ochenti, but also from government agencies, including the Tanzania Social Action Fund, which implements the government cash transfer program, and the Tanzania Commission for AIDS. We also had participation in the evaluation team from UNICEF Tanzania, as well as local research partners, EDI Global. We have continuously shared findings at both the national and district levels. And I'm very sorry that my colleague Busajo is having some challenges with the connectivity because she has done a phenomenal job sharing at every stage along the way, along with our government partners, the findings at the district level, including briefs and presentations in Swahili. We have also uh, produced regional and global dissemination products, including many reports, peer-reviewed journal articles, presentations, videos, and also animations of the study finding. I encourage you to look at the UNICEF Innocenti website where you can find those. The evaluation of this Cash Plus pilot was designed as a cluster randomized control trial. It was conducted in 130 villages in four districts in the Southern Highlands region of Tanzania. The treatment arm received the Cash Plus components that I mentioned previously, while the control arm received cash only. We followed over 2,000 youth and their households and interviewed community and health facilities between 2017 and 2021. Today, we're going to be focusing on the findings between uh, at follow-up rounds from 2018 and 2019. Lucy presented this diagram previously, where you can see that the program has had positive impacts on a range of different domains relevant to the SDGs. If we try to look a little bit more in depth and looking first at the structural drivers, which most of you working in the HIV field know that structural drivers is used in HIV to describe a range of factors acting at macro and community levels that fundamentally shape and influence patterns of HIV risk behavior and facilitate or impede an individual or group's ability to access services or adhere to treatment. These shape and influence patterns of behavior and individual capacities. So if we look at these structural drivers, we see that this cash plus intervention has had positive impacts on economic opportunity, areas relative, relevant to gender norms. So we saw positive impacts on business startup, having a business in operation, livestock keeping, and the purchase of assets. In terms of gender norms, we saw positive impacts on gender equitable attitudes, which is a first step in changing norms. And we saw these particularly among males. We did, however, find one unexpected impact around schooling dropout among a small group of older girls participating in the program. But when we followed them up at multiple points after that, we did not see any further impacts on school attendance or attainment. So this appears to be a small temporary impact. Then if in turn, if we look at the more proximate determinants of risk, we see that the intervention had many positive impacts on access to services, interpersonal violence, and access to information. We saw positive impacts on visits to health facilities, discussion of contraception with providers, HIV testing, However, we did not see improvements in contraceptive use. So while knowledge and discussion with health service facility providers increased, 
uptake of contraceptives did not. We also saw positive impacts on information about HIV prevention and, as I mentioned, modern contraceptive knowledge. In terms of sexual behaviors, we did not see impacts on unprotected sex, transactional sex, or having age disparate partnerships. However, we did see a half year delay in sexual debut among adolescent girls. And in terms of interpersonal violence, we saw reductions in sexual violence experiences among girls and decreased perpetration rates of physical violence among adolescent males. So in conclusion, protective effects on HIV-related drivers and risks were found from jointly addressing economic and health capacities. Also, by jointly addressing both the demand and supply side of health services, we saw increased health access. Structural interventions such as Cash Plus can address economic opportunities, but they can also reduce violence, improve mental health, and delay age of first sex. And all of these deliver co-benefits that should be central to HIV responses. In addition, from a financing perspective, such interventions which combine economic strengthening with these add-ons have co-benefits and potential for impact at scale. And thus decisions around financing can leverage these benefits to make the case for co-funding of these programs. So the takeaway that I'd like to share with you today is that there are some key considerations for integrating social protection to achieve HIV related objectives. So as we've seen from Lucy's presentation and our presentation here today, programs, cash plus programs can address different drivers and structural determinants of risk. Some may take longer to materialize than others. Um, so we need to be thinking about the pathways pay attention to impacts on poverty and school attendance, violence and health services utilization, because impacts on HIV incidence and adherence to treatment can take longer to materialize. But if we see these pathway impacts, those are very promising and can have longer term impacts. We also need to think about a systems approach and Ruth really emphasized that in her presentation. We need to coordinate across sectors, including social welfare, health and education. And this intersectoral coordination can help address the multidimensional poverty and vulnerability that adolescents and young people face. We also need to think long-term. As I mentioned, the evidence on pathways is very important and can give us an idea of what we might expect in the longer term. And we need to think long term in terms of scalability through existing infrastructure. What types of linkages and complementary program can be built on to the infrastructure that social protection systems already have so as not to overburden them, but to complement the positive benefits that they're having. In this way, we can start to improve on the sustainability through cross-sectoral funding. I'd like to acknowledge our donors that have supported both this pilot and the evaluation, as well as the support of TASAP and TACAIDS personnel and our hardworking collaborators at EDI Global. You can find more information about this study on the links here. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Tia, um, for sharing these interesting findings from Tanzania. And also a big thank you to uh, Lusakio. I know she's been instrumental, especially in the qualitative part of this, um, of this research. Uh, unfortunately, the internet is a little bit shaky at the moment in Tanzania. So I will hope that won't affect our next speakers as well, but just a great thank you for this excellent work and, and overview. Um, so to understand the initiative behind these numbers, our final presentation will focus on the intervention details and the implementation lessons learned um, from implementing Cash Plus in Tanzania, which will be uh, co-presented by Ulrike or Uli Gilbert, the chief of HIV, um, together with Frank Itama, who is HIV specialist at UNICEF Tanzania. And I will quickly share the slides and then you can take over. Great, thank you so much and warm good afternoon or nearly good evening from Dar es Salaam and Tanzania. Thank you very much to the organizers for having us. 
And um, now that we've listened to the impactful results on the Cash Plus program in Tanzania, but also the other important data points from Professor Kluver before and in other countries, um, Frank and myself will share with you some um, thoughts on, on the implementation aspects of these kind of programs. So um, we can go to the next slide. When we started in Tanzania to develop the Cash Plus, which is, I mean, uh, in Tanzania, the, the Ujana Salama program, it is tailored for adolescents 14 to 19 from extremely poor households and those households who receive a government um, cash transfer program. As a background, those of you are not familiar, but Tanzania has a large scale um, government uh, cash transfer program and not just cash transfer, but also livelihood enhancement um, and other components. So when this program was designed, we worked together with the government on putting a few principles in place to hold each other um, by uh, from the get go. So one was the very early on leadership and ownership by the government, that is their platform. Um, and then the second one is you need to find a home for these kind of programs. In our case, it is the um, Productive Social Safety Network, which is the government um, program for this country, and in particular, the livelihood enhancement framework of this, of this program. Then the third principle was around age and gender sensitive dovetailed health and livelihood interventions. The fourth, fourth one, sorry, was about thinking beyond just um, offering trainings or additional trainings to young people in those households, but really to think about financial health and social assets building of those adolescent boys and girls who come from very, very difficult backgrounds where mental health issues are also often a problem. And then the fifth and last one was to establish functional linkages with existing government services. So for that, one needs to understand what kind of government services are available and which other government partner is responsible for delivering them. Those were the key principles we worked on at the beginning. And we'll go to the next slide. In terms of the, um, Rika, can you sh uh, shift the slides? Yes, sorry, it was a bit slow. No problem. So, I mean, just in summary, so what the PLUS entails is this face-to-face -face training. It is now seven weeks. In the early days when the evaluation was done, it was 12 weeks, but this has been a modification that we shortened this face-to-face -face training and the training is dovetailed, sexual reproductive health and rights, HIV and violence. And then there is a productive grant, which is a small amount of money the young people use to start up their own small business or for livelihood activities. There's a mentorship and coaching period, which is over a period of at least nine months for the young people to have an opportunity to practice now their, their newly gained skills. And then there's active referral to health services and livelihood opportunities. The program, when it started in um, 2020, 2018, was for in-school and out-of-school adolescents. What I'm presenting to you here now is where we have made revisions that we're focusing now on out-of-school adolescents for a variety of reasons. We'll go to the next slide. So for the implementation arrangements, um, we, you know, it is, it is along the government administrative structure. So at central and national level in Tanzania, you have um, the Tanzania Social Action Fund, TASAF, who are the owners of the program. And TASAF has a structure to regional, which is the equivalent of a province, for example, in South Africa, down to district and then right down to community level, where um, at all levels there are TASAF focal persons or government offices which have a TASAF function, if that's the right way of planning it. 
explaining it, but to make to say that there's a government administrative system in place at all levels. And that there are other important partners to think about, which, you know, which need to be brought on board at the beginning. And in our case, it was the Tanzania Commission for AIDS, and then also our colleagues from the Ministry of Health, Gender. Um, and we also brought in an NGO partner for short-term technical assistance. The program now is implemented in four regions um, and in 11 districts um, and councils in those regions and now in 348 villages from the earlier 65 villages, which were part of the control villages, sorry, the intervention villages in the evaluation. We go to the next slide. Now, this is just a few bullet points in terms of roles and responsibility of the different government and the NGO partner working on this. As I've explained, TASAV is the owner and the leader of the program. So they manage cash plus as part of their regular PSSN program. And TASAV was from the, right from the beginning part of co-designing the concept. And um, they supervise all the local government staff at regional district and council level. And then also they have the platform to coordinate with other donors and development partners and other government partners. That's quite an important element as well. TESAP is also part of the national evaluation team and includes, you know, of course, the approval of evaluation um, data coming out of this. The Tanzania Commission for AIDS has also played an important role. They're also a member of the national evaluation team, and they're looking at the HIV and the SRH and GBV components. They also play an important role in terms of leveraging HIV funding. And in our case, they have used the cash plus design to leverage additional funding from the Global Fund to implement similar um, programs in other parts of the country. TACAIDS also coordinates with the US government, in particular the PEPFA Dreams program, which is a major investor in HIV prevention programs for girls. Then the um, Ministry of Health, a very long acronym on the slide, they are also a formal partner in the program and they're particularly responsible for training and supporting the health facility, the supply side of the intervention. UNICEF did bring in an NGO for short-term technical assistance around the youth peer education and mentor, uh, mentor training aspect around sexual reproductive health, HIV and GBV, but not to deliver the services, more as a technical assistance provided to equip government staff with the skills um, needed. We'll move to the next slide. These are the different roles, which we thought could be also interesting for colleagues to understand. But I mean, the main message is to the need to understand the government administrative structure and which structure and which level is responsible for what. In our case, the regional or provincial government, um, they are they play an important role to oversee the districts. Um, and for us, the, um, um, the regional government helped to develop and manage the district implementation plans. They also played a role in selecting the staff to be trained as trainers of trainers. They play a role in the supervision of the routine activities. And that is a role for both, for the districts and the regions to have that supervisory role um, and planning as well. They need to do that together. Too. Then um, the other three elements are about the monitoring of the productive grant that's done at district level. And then to make sure that government extension offices are available and in support for the mentorship phase that is also done at district level. And then the district level is responsible to consolidate the reports and the inputs, et cetera, and feed that up into the information management system. Um, <clears throat> these are important consideration if one thinks about sustainability and scale, because sustainability isn't just about the money and who's financing it. It's, it's how does it sit on the different um, uh, yeah, levels of government. 
I'll hand over now to my colleague, Frank, who will share a little bit of information, but important information about what's happening at community level. Um, and then in, also in terms of conclusion, our lessons and our thoughts about this Cash Plus implementation aspects. Frank, over to you. Okay, thank you, Uli. Uh, so uh, it, we, there was a great need to include the community level and the community at the community level we worked with the leadership that is uh, village leadership specifically village executive officers and the village chairpersons and we also engaged the community management committees and these are the uh, community committees that are selected by uh, village uh, assembly and they are given responsibility of monitoring all our task of activities and they uh, they reported to the village government village village development committee bdc which goes up to ward development and goes also to the district level so this is uh, one of the lowest level in the government local government here so we we involved them as well so the roles that they played uh, for the village executive officers and the village chairpersons, they are responsible in supporting the uh, selection of peer educators and mentors. And also they were also engaged during the intensive seven weeks training. They will attend the, 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 they will attend the trainings, make sure that all the, uh, the participants do attend. They also assisted in trying to get venues for the meetings, for the trainings and all other uh, permissions, anything that is needed, and sometimes even to address some concerns from the parents. We also used the uh, CMC's committees to try to, in, to identify and enroll adolescents to participate in the programs, and also to, to mobilize parents and guardians of these uh, adolescents to provide support, to advise uh, their, 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 their children, and to guide them as they're implementing their programs. Next. Next slide. Yeah, so how was the implementation cascade? As uh, Uli uh, stated earlier, this implementation of this program started from the national level, uh, cascading down to the regional district level, down to the community. So uh, we, we did some introduction starting from the national level where we discussed the yeah, agreed on how the program is going to be developed the, the manuals, and uh, partnerships and so forth. And then uh, from there, we moved to the to the regional and the district level, the same down to the community level. And after the series of introductions, uh, we, we did the resource mapping at the district level to try to see what are the structures, that, the supportive structure that are there to be able to support these adolescents, link, uh, to provide the linkages, referrals in all aspects, be it uh, on the health issues or on the livelihood issues. So things like uh, hospitals, things like um, uh, vocational training institutions that are around, industries, big um, farms, estates, and so forth, areas where some of the practical uh, lessons can be uh, available for these sort of listeners as they, are, they, 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 they continue through their trainings. And after that, we trained, uh, uh, we trained the TOTs. These were selected from uh, the, the council level. And uh, after the, they are selected, we conducted training. And these trainings were conducted jointly uh, by the people from uh, TASAF national level, uh, TACADS, Minister of Health as well as, well as our counterpart NGOs. And then after training, uh, then we moved it down to the village level where uh, we, we identified uh, people to be trained as mentors and peer educators, as well as enrollment of the uh, adolescent beneficiaries. After that, uh, the TOTs trained the mentors, those mentors were selected, they were trained for two weeks. And after that, these mentors cascaded down the trainings uh, to the uh, to the village level, where now the our adolescents who are selected in all the villages will be trained in their own in the village they are, they are they are residing, and after completion of the trainings, which goes hand in hand with the development of the business plans, then the productive grant will be given, 
and that will be followed by the period of uh, uh, mentorship and also linkage and referrals to other services. And uh, for, the, for the referrals, we also worked with health facilities and we also worked with the uh, extension workers. And these extension workers were from uh, agriculture, uh, from trade, and other, 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 other disciplines at the village level. Next. So uh, health facilities also are uh, the played part. Uh, and the, the, the reason why we engage the health facility workers is that uh, one of the things that uh, the cash pass program did was to create a demand for services. So once we create a demand for services, we anticipated that the number of adolescent seeking services will increase, and therefore the facilities needed to be ready to, uh, to provide these services when needed. So we worked together with the Minister of Health, especially the Reproductive and Child Health Section of the Minister of Health, to equip uh, the health workers with uh, trainings on adolescent friendly services, and also to do some minor adjustments within the facility, things like uh, uh, facility hours to, to set specific hours for adolescents, to set specific areas, for instance, for adolescents, and even have some designated staff who will be uh, providing services to the, to, the, to the adolescents, and also to engage uh, peer educators because uh, after completion of the seven weeks of training, the peer, peer educator activities moved to health facilities and they worked in close collaboration and supervision of these trained health workers. So uh, health uh, workers, they will also offer uh, uh, responsible health services, uh, make sure that they have available equipment and supplies for adolescents, and also to try to do some outreach to the, to the, to the trained community health workers and to make sure that that uh, referral between community health facility and back to the uh, community works efficiently. Next. So as we said, one of the components, one of the important aspects of these uh, cash plus programs is to be able to, uh, to adjust, to be able to learn and uh, uh, to change uh, depending on what you learn. So, uh, as you had, this uh, program was had two arms. One arm was was implementation arm, and another one was the randomized control trial arm. And uh, we we had almost th three waves of uh, evaluation, and each wave came up with some results that were worth. Uh, we, we, we had to adjust some of the uh, program components based on the findings of the findings of these uh, evaluations. And one of the things that we, we, we learned was that uh, there was uh, some of the outcomes, intended outcomes of the school at, at attendance for adolescents that necessitated us to focus now for out of school uh, instead of combining in school and out of school as we stated. We started. Second, uh, we had to shorten the training because initially it was 12 weeks. Despite the fact that the trainings will happen one day per week, uh, for those 12 weeks, but still we found out that the training was so, uh, uh, the, the duration was so uh, spread and somehow our adolescent found it boring. So we had to bring it together so that it can be intense. So now uh, the training is conducted for seven weeks. And we also uh, revised some uh, training uh, materials to incorporate some of the things that we have found important. One was that, uh, uh, most or some of these adolescents were already uh, parents. So we didn't have the parenting uh, skills part in the initial training manual. So we had to, re to revise it and include the parenting part. And also there are issues around uh, focus of the program where we found out that for the out of school, there was importance of trying to look into the, uh, the training uh, to include more issues on the, on, on the uh, livelihood, but not livelihood per se, but to, to, to work more on issues around uh, skills that will be, able, will be able to help them to, 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 to start the income generating activities and uh, proceed that in their lives. So, and another uh, thing that will necessitate the change of the program was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Initially, when the COVID started, we had to to stop. Some of the programs had to be halted because uh, of the restrictions, no gathering, no traveling, and so forth. So uh, 
for us to be able to continue with the trainings, we needed to do some adjustment where we included some of the uh, COVID-19 prevention uh, uh, components and we are able to proceed with the trainings. And now that's the, the, the way the trainings are being conducted. Next. So in summary, what are the key takeaways from this uh, program as we are implementing this program? One is that uh, we have had, uh, we have enjoyed a good uh, collaboration with the government because of the, of the government ownership from the beginning. We engage the government from the way to go and uh, planning, implementation, monitoring, everything. So there is that big, uh, strong uh, government ownership. And also we are implementing this program through government uh, structures at all levels from the national level, regional uh, council up to the community level. And also uh, we, we have, uh, we selected uh, these trainers and the mentors from the villages. And this made sure that they are available all the time. And some of them were government uh, employees and we used them as, uh, as mentors as well as uh, people who were conducting this support uh, from extension uh, background. And this proved to be a very crucial decision. And even the, the, the mother uh, PSSN program has now copied they are training, uh, they are training the mentors and uh, people to conduct a mentorship from extension workers. We had uh, TOTs at the district level or council level, and this uh, made it easier for them to be able to conduct supervision, even when they go there on the other activities they're implementing at the district level and making sure that the cash plus activities are supervised and they are integrated as a part of the day-to-day uh, -day activity that are happening at the council level. And we had a good community involvement. Uh, we, we had engaged the village executive officers, village chairpersons, and village management committees. And this made sure that everybody at the community level knows what is going on. And the fact that the, uh, the mentors were selected by village assembly, so everybody was aware when activities are happening, they know that, that these activities and this is what is needed. And the role of uh, village leaders and even other uh, influential leaders of the community uh, took part in making sure that the program is a success. And also uh, one of the good things that happened with the program is that uh, we created demand for services. And this uh, uh, looked at the uh, access to health, services and even uh, livelihood opportunities. And uh, the fact that we also, uh, we also uh, equipped the health facilities made sure that we, 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 we addressed most of the needs that of the recent health. And that's why you find out that some of the uh, indicators came out positive as we saw in the previous presentation by our research counterparts. Next. Yeah, however, there are some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the cash pass program was implemented using the PSSN platform. And at some points we find out that we were limited, especially on the smooth uh, implementation and quick implementation of activities because we relied much on the task of staff. And uh, we have had changes here with the PSSN program where we moved from PSSN one to PSSN2, and that transition uh, somehow affected us. And also for the scale up, uh, the purpose of the program or the need, the, 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 one of the uh, things we had from the beginning was that we would like to implement this program and scale up to, the, to cover all the national uh, uh, as the PSSN program is. But then we needed to have exactly the cost of implementing this. Uh, the cost of implementing this program, or rather how uh, better or cost effectively can we implement this program. So as we are talking now, we have embarked on the investment case study, where we are going to see some, some possible options through which we can be able to scale up the program. Despite the fact that we, from the findings we got from the midterm review of the program, uh, the government and TASAF in particular, decided that it was a program worth uh, are scaling up, that's why we moved from the initial 65 villages and now we are in the almost 348 villages. 
So another lesson we learned was that the system approach was useful. It helped us in coordination, especially in the different sectors as you've seen. We have the government, several government ministries, department and agencies. We have UN agencies, we have our NGO, we have local government authorities. And all of these are working together with the community to make sure that the program moves on. And even uh, you see the way the program has been financed. We have financing from all those partners that are working together to address the multidisciplinary poverty and vulnerability of the adolescents. Next. Okay, so finally, I would like to convey sincere gratitude to TASAF, uh, TACADES, and the national evaluation teams, and also for uh, the donor agents, development agency that helped me to fund this program, Oak Foundation, UNICEF, SIDA, DFID, and Irish Aid. Next. Yeah, thank you on behalf of Uli. And I think uh, the links were shared in the previous presentation where we'll be able to find a lot of publications with regards to this uh, program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Frank and Uli, for this great, excellent presentation on the realities on the ground and implementing this program. Um, the discussions have been quite rich and the presentation is quite rich, so we actually only have around 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, a lot of the questions have already been answered in the Q&A box, but there are a few that I would like to um, bring up to answer. And the first one um, is coming from Kamuyu Mwai on how do cash transfers reduce risky sexual behaviors and intimate partner violence? Is this really an issue to be addressed socially or monetarily? And um, Ruth, you have already been involved with this, but please, if you can answer this question. And Lusatio as well, if um, you are still on and there's any connection through, um, Lusatio is uh, specialized in adolescent sex risky sexual behavior. So please um, add on after Ruth. Great. Or maybe I'll, maybe I'll focus on the IPV um, aspect then, and hoping that the, the internet connection has improved. Um, yeah, I, a few things to highlight. I know we're pretty short on time, but um, first of all, I think in terms of the impacts and kind of how, um, how, how does this happen? Um, we know from systematic review of rigorous evaluations of cash transfer programs that they... Um, uh, can uh, reduce intimate partner violence um, and there's some promising evidence around sexual violence for adolescent girls less so in other um, areas of violence but you know the evidence is emerging um, there are different sort of hypotheses around the pathways um, that lead to that um, kind of impact um, one of them around uh, reducing poverty related stress um, which can be a trigger for violence one which is around increasing women's economic um, well-being and social well-being I think there's some really interesting kind of the evidence just keeps um, keeps keep sort of growing in, in this area it's very live but for example um really interesting work in in bangladesh which shows that um just providing um cash alone whilst you see an impact on intimate viol partner violence it doesn't sustain over time but when it was linked to nutrition sensitive um kind of plus components actually and i think it's so interesting but the, the impact on intimate partner violence was sustained over time and the hypothesis around that is that um whilst the sessions are focused on nutrition it supports social capital of the women involved it supports their um, knowledge and um, sort of self-esteem um, and so on and so it just shows you that although you might think of cash transfers as sort of monetary or non-social they are having these social impacts which can have um, sort of secondary and, and sustained impacts and then another pathway is around pa power dynamics within the household and so you know if, if women are um, supported and empowered within um, a, a household that that might have an impact on, on um, power dynamics and, and therefore um, relationships but uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is I don't think this is a case of something that's as kind of as complex and deep-rooted as intimate partner violence and more broadly gender-based violence we can't expect cash or cash plus to do everything you know the, the root causes of these behaviors are gender inequality and, and power and so we should be thinking about great there's evidence here we should look to support that we should be looking to um, address the sort of the triggers the drivers of violence um, but we should also be looking at those root causes the social norms that underpin them you know Tia mentioned sort of the gender equitable attitudes the sort of one step on that journey and I think you know there's really um 
uh, interesting evidence around the power of supporting women's and feminist um, rights organizations in supporting their shifts and norms. We're seeing evidence from different sectors around that. Um, it's not an either or. We need to be supporting that, that work to address social norms and, and root causes. And then the final thing I know you highlighted, um, isn't it about sort of psychosocial support and counseling? That's definitely part of the picture. We need to be responding to the needs of survivors, um, but it's not the be all and end all. You know, we should be looking at prevention and response together. Um, and over to Losaccio if, if, the, if the internet's working. Thank you, Ruth. Losaccio, let's try. Yes, thank you. So I hope this works out. Um, Ruth, I did you already, I think you already did uh, a good job. I would just add also about um, having, uh, you know, cash and training in the plus. Uh, that includes gender awareness, improves agency of the adolescent girls, and of course, possibility to ne negotiate uh, safe sex. Uh, so that could lead to reduced um, infection rate for HIV. Excellent, thank you. Um, so staying on the evidence part, a couple of questions um, for Lucy and, and Rachel. Uh, one question come through, has come through from Hillary um, with the costing studies have showed that cash plus interventions are cost effective in improving HIV outcomes. Um, and the second one is in regards to reaching both adolescent boys and girls, do we have any data on the impact of differential um, packages offered to boys versus girls? Well, let, let me start by talking about this costing question, because it's absolutely the right now, the hundred million dollar question, you know, can we um, can we really understand what is the most cost effective approach? And I should say that, please, um, we'll come back in about two months time because we're just finalizing um, the very first um, real attempts to do cost effectiveness analysis across these multiple outcomes. There was some very effective work led by um, Charlotte Watts and a team at um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine a few years ago. Um, which found that, and, and the lead author's name I've completely forgotten, so someone please type it in. Um, but, um, but what they found was, and they, and they looked at um, the um, a cash program, cash um, social protection program in Malawi, and found that it was effective, um, but that it was effective not just on um, on HIV prevention, but that it was also effective on violence prevention and on education. And when you summed up those, you got a highly cost effective program. Now, I think the thing that we need to remember with HIV though, that we've learned the hard way over the last um, two decades has been that we have to address with HIV, you have to address both these very proximal pathways to HIV infection, like, you know, um, not buying a condom or, or um, you know, immediate pathways like age disparate sex. But at the same time, you have to try and address these, these other pathways like dropping out of school, which we know is a kind of two phase pathway to HIV infection or violence victimization, which increases HIV infection um, over the next 10 to 20 years of a, of a young woman's life. And so actually, when we look at HIV prevention, we're likely to be very much highly more cost effective by targeting both media and direct pathway to HIV infection. But hold this space for two months, we'll come back to you with some actual numbers on this. Um, Rachel, do you want to talk briefly? Um, I feel I'm less good on the kind of gender stuff than you are. And Ruth think, might have some. Um, yeah, Alona might just, be good on the on some of the sort of gender, because I often find it's quite, I mean, when I was at Girls Not Brides, there was a lot of debate about, is it all about social norms? Is it all about economic transformation? And I think the answer is it's both. And I do sometimes think there's a bit of an unhealthy sort of false dichotomy about norms, economic, you know, but actually I think as Ruth very eloquently sort of set out that cash transfers can help uh, create social capital shift um, power dynamics by keeping girls in school where it's also bringing about sort of normative change. But there is no one single magic bullet. And that's why I think some of these 
cash and normative interventions together is where we need to be seeing more. And you know, we've been having some discussions in Ethiopia about what if you combined the PSNP program with programs that are supporting community education, say through the community health workers, how would these two interventions really help uh, address things like education or child marriage and so on? So I think it's sort of, perhaps we should be a little less sort of tribal about our positions on these things and think about how we can bring interventions together to, um, to really sort of maximize the, the impact. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we'll take a couple of implementation questions. Um, Frank, over to you on this one. Uh, Hugh Salmon is asking how you incentivize the community level volunteers, um, assuming that you know the community based actors are all volunteers, and how did you then minimize the turnover and dropout, um, assuming that these volunteers will also need time and resources to look out for their overall livelihoods on the side of, of cash plus intervention and were, was recruitment and retention a challenge in, in the cash plus program? Yeah, thank you, uh, Rike. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we all know the challenge of working with the community and uh, especially the so-called volunteer programs. However, uh, I think um, the internet in Tanzania is, ah, there we go, Frank is back. You're on mute. Yeah, so the internet is on off here and I'm, I'm using, I'm, I'm out of the, of the normal uh, ethernet from the, the office. I'm seated somewhere because of the noises. But uh, what I was saying is that uh, th th there are challenges with the volunteer programs at the community level. However, uh, this one, we, we had considered that from the beginning. So the selection criteria for those to act as, uh, to be trained as mentors, took consideration of the fact that we might uh, be faced with the challenge of incentivizing them in the first place. So uh, we looked at the extension workers who are government uh, employees at the wadi level, village level, to ensure that uh, whatever they'll be doing with the program will be part of their day-to-day -day work. And uh, in the areas where uh, extension workers were not there, we used some people who have already been working as volunteers, people who have been involved, engaged in the community programs as the community health workers, our community-based distributors, paralegals, parasocial workers. So those are the people that we took. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we, we did during the trainings, they had a small stipend to enable them to uh, travel from here and there as they're implementing the, the, the program. But also the community uh, also had their own ways of incentivizing them. For instance, if there are issues that everybody needed to contribute or to take part in it, these were exempted because they had already volunteered to work uh, in the community programs. So that also uh, helped me. And also there was a, the whole issue of social esteem. They had some uh, recognition by the work that we are doing. Some of them were being called a teacher, teacher, and that somehow kept them going and uh, we didn't face much uh, problem. And actually uh, for, the, for the talking of the issue of dropout, there was more concern with the adolescent participants themselves than mentors and, 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 and facilitators because uh, Adolescents, as you know, it's the period of rapid change and they, they want to, to take opportunity as they, as they come. So uh, we, we, in some of the areas uh, we are implementing, it, it, there were areas where there are big uh, estates, where there is uh, uh, plantations that uh, they harvest, they do some harvesting at particular seasons, or oh, there was a timber industry, for instance, in Iringa. So you find when those seasons comes up, the adolescents will leave and go to to work in those areas. But we see this one, uh, because they knew there is some, uh, they are trained on the livelihood, and after that they're going to get some small capital, they, 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 they stick with the program. And they, we only had 11% uh, 11 uh, 11 attrition rate from uh, the first year and second year of the program, which I think was, uh, was great. The researchers will, 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 will speak about that. Wonderful, thanks, Frank. And perhaps your other implementation question I can direct to you, um, Uli. 
There's a question around um, the mentors and the peer educators. Um, first of all, if, if the curriculum is available for anyone else to access uh, for inspiration, but also what were the criteria used to selecting these mentors and peer educators and how was the quality of the, su the support that they provided? How was that um, verified or monitored over time? Yeah, so for, will you, will you take that? <laughs> you can go ahead, Frank. Okay, so for the for the peer educators, uh, one they they were supposed to be uh, among the adolescent beneficiaries from those villages. So we will choose one girl and one boy, and they should be able to read and write. They should be able to to organize others. They should be able to to, to have that self drive. And for the mentors, we looked at uh, people who had already started volunteering or doing some community work in the places where we didn't have extension workers. So we we'll look at the uh, adults who are above 19 years old. They should be respected at the community level and they should be able to read and write. They should be able to facilitate and they should have good conduct. And when you select them from the village assembly, uh, there is a likelihood of getting people who are accepted and uh, uh, recognized or at least well-spoken by men in the, in the community. So those are some of the simple, simple uh, qualifications that we use in selecting the, 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 the mentors and the peer educators. And as for curriculum, the curriculums are available. As I've said, they were developed uh, uh, jointly between the, 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 the TASAF, uh, TACAITS, uh, RSCH section, as well as uh, NGO partner. And in this one, we used the uh, TechnoSave. I think TechnoSave, uh, well-known organization, we used those for, for the library component and the Tamasha, which is a local uh, youth uh, based or youth focused uh, NGO, they helped us with the, with the uh, uh, HIV, reproductive health, GBV uh, component of the training. Thanks so much, Frank. And I, I see that we're out of time. I'm gonna ask the last question to Tia and then perhaps um, I see all panelists have also been answering questions in writing. And so those answers we can send out to everyone as well. Um, but just Tia, before we close up, um, two questions for you. One is a, a question has come through from Karim on um, the fact that the intervention showed a positive effect on modern family planning methods. Um, however, the, the uptake of family planning did not improve and whether the team had a chance to explore the reason for this and perhaps you know how to, to address it. And then the second question is, we had a, a little bit of discussion in the Q&A box around uh, sustainability and you know giving someone a fish or something to fish with. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about the, the myth busting around uh, providing cash transfers. Thank you, Rika, and thanks for the questions. Um, in terms of contraceptive knowledge and uptake, we found in both a previous evaluation of the cash alone and this evaluation of the cash plus that both increased knowledge of modern contraceptives, but neither increased use of modern contraceptives. And I think that's what that's telling us is that there are still some financial or other barriers to accessing health services. One really promising area of cash plus or integrated social protection is linking these anti-poverty programs to social health protection, such as enrollment in Tanzania into the community health fund, which is a form of community-based health insurance. So this could help address some of the barriers and TASAF is, starting new efforts to link the cash transfer households to fee waivers to enroll in the community health fund because right now these very poor households are not eligible for premium fee waivers and those are still a significant barrier. In terms of the second question around um, teaching people to fish, I think that this is something that we hear very often, that if you give cash to people, it will make them lazy, they'll stop working, they'll spend it on alcohol. And we've done a lot of research and from our own primary data that we've collected from these evaluations as part of the transfer project, 
but also reviews around the globe have shown that when you give poor households cash, they use it in very productive ways. They buy fertilizer, they buy productive assets, and they start businesses, they take care of livestock. So what they're doing is they're investing in their own productive potential. They also enroll their children in school. People spend this money in very smart, effective ways. And it's investing in their children and their households and their livelihoods. And we don't see any evidence that they spend it on things like alcohol and tobacco. So we can put our trust in households to make the right decisions for their families. Thank you, Tia. And I did say there was a last question, but I do have one I would like to direct to Uli and then we'll close it out. Uli, I was just wondering, there was a question that I think is really important to address um, from Deborah around who receives the cash benefits across the early half of the life cycle. So in this intervention where there's both a, a cash transfer to the household and a productive grant, if you can just speak a little bit to um, who receives what, um, and why, and you know, if there's any specific work being done to address unintended consequences related to these cash transfers. Yeah, the regular, thank you. It's a really important question. And the regular CCT in Tanzania is given to the household. There's a mechanism in place how that is transferred in the, and with established criteria. The productive grant, um, which is part of the PLUS package, there's an elaborate um, process in place so that the parents or the guardians and the, or the head of the household agree and are involved when the cash is given to, to the young person so that we do not have unintended conse uh, consequences. The, you know, the young people develop business plans. There's a... Um, the village committee is involved. They need to approve the, the business plan and they need to show support that, um, that the, how they're supporting the young people to implement their different plans. But I think to be honest, I think the most important aspect is the involvement of the head of the household or the guardian that they are, you know, that the young people do have an opportunity to use the grants as they had planned to. So of course, you know, the program is by no means perfect. It's, we've come a long way and there's so much more further we need, we need to go. I think it's important that one is very aware and mitigates and actually avoids giving only cash, you know, directly to individuals, which we know has harmful consequences and creates stress. So that's how we've tried to mitigate it. It's, I'm not sure if I understand this thing about the first, um, what was it about the first life cycle or something? It's the, the first half of the life cycle. So when it's given to someone that oh, is not program. an adult. Yeah. yeah so so when the, I, think, I, I was thinking the life cycle of a person, like a, long, like a young child, typical UNICEF thing. Uh, no, that's um, how I understand it as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Just when there's, yeah. Sure. No, so I mean, so there is the seven week period now where they go through the training and um, at the end of that period, they develop their, their sim very simple plans. I mean, one of the premises of Cash Plus in Tanzania, the Sujana Salama, is you work with what's locally available, you know, and, 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 and some of these communities, they're ultra poor. So when I say business plans, we have to be realistic. These are very simple structured plans of what this young person would like to do with the productive grant. Then there is a, there's the mentoring process around it, which I think is also helping to reduce and ideally prevent it, but it's certainly to reduce unintended consequences. So where adult trained mentors work with the trained, with the, with the young people over a period of nine months to, to move forward because, you know, let's be honest, livelihood activities, but none of these things are very easy to do. And there are, um, there are, not everyone is successful the first time around. That's why you need mentorship in addition to, to, the, to the small grant to help them move forward with their plans. I hope I have answered the question, but um, it's the combination of these different factors, which I think is, is helping. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Uli. Um, and yes, unfortunately, we're not just out of time, we're over time. But I think this um, discussion was really, really interesting and adding the different aspects of, of cash and of the health intervention. So I wish that we could all stay on much longer to discuss. Um, but if there are any remaining questions, um, please send them through on email uh, and we will get back to you. I will post my email in the chat box. Um, and again, I wanted to note that this is the first web, uh, part in a webinar series on social protection and health. So I know that, um, that many people had to drop off, but if those that are remaining on the webinar, if you have any interesting findings or initiatives you would like to share in a future uh, webinar, please do reach out. And then I just want to give a warm thanks um, again to all of our speakers for their contributions to this really important topic and for sharing the knowledge, um, the passion and the insights with us today.